Well, welcome uh, from Rosa, Minnesota. Uh, a little bit of snow this morning, and the guys are getting a little bit antsy for ice fishing. But we're not talking ice fishing. We're talking about P and K and soybeans. So I better get moving up with that. I'm going to give a little bit of background of why the research was uh, initiated in the first place, uh, some of the methods that we used to, to conduct the, this small plot work, and uh, then some of the results. So. The objectives really was to establish a long-term, uh, at least a four-year minimum rotation of wheat and soybeans and conduct both small and large plot trials to determine the, what influence that elevated levels of P and K would have on wheat and soybean growth, development, yield, and seed quality. Uh, had a, just a fantastic group of partners to work with on this project, uh, AFRAC, Minnesota Wheat, Minnesota Soybeans, U of M, and of course we couldn't do some of the on-farm work without the farmer cooperators. So the project really was developed or designed for both small and large plot work. Well, even though the, the small and large plots uses different methods and equipment, they do and oftentimes can comp complement one another. Uh, the small plot trials, what we try to do there is, is pick out a uniform area in the field uh, and really try to reduce the variability. Well, on farm, that's not possible. Uh, we all know in the real world, there's variability from end to end and side to side in, in every field. So the on farm, you gotta try to manage that variability and the small plots, we try to minimize variability. Scope of the project really was USDA District 10, and that's the area from Kitson and Rosa County to the north, uh, down to Clay and Becker in the south. And in that area in the decade from 2017 to 2007, had a, a, an increase of 2007 was 1.1 million acres of soybeans, 2017, 1.8. Soybean yields is relatively flat in that time period. But wheat yields, you can see in 2007 were 50.4 and 2017 were 65.8. So the research question we wanted to answer is, is P and K part of the reason why we're not seeing uh, an increase in wheat yields? So Minnesota soils, what do we know? Well, we know Lake Agassiz is the origin of the area of soils. The closer you get to the river, you got the more lacustrian uh, makeup of the soil. Uh, east and west of that, you get a little bit further, you get more beach ridge. We know we're cold in the spring, and we know cold soils can reduce nutrient uptake. A lot of the areas we have high pH soils, that's also a, can limit uh, nutrient uptake. But we know a 50 bushel bean crop will remove 40 pounds of P2O5 and 70 pounds of K2O. And an 80 bushel wheat crop will remove 50 pounds of P and 30 pounds of K2O. So a lot of guys saying, well, at 70, 30, 30, we'll get all I need to, that's all I need to put on. Well, if you do that, you're really expecting the contribution from the soil, kind of you're mining the soil to, to obtain the P and K necessary for those high pH soils. Um, what are the levels of, of P and K in the soil? This is some uh, survey work from Agvise, uh, compliments of John Lee. On the left, you have the Olson P test, and you can see in the very corner there, uh, Northwest Minnesota, 86% of the samples that were sent to Agvise in 2019 were less than 15 parts per million on the Olson test. You get a little bit further east, it's uh, 73%. So roughly three quarters of the samples that were sent in had soil test P levels of less than 15 parts per million. On the right is soil sample soil test potassium levels and areas close to the river you see up, up northwest Minnesota 32 percent of the samples sent in were less than 150 parts per million but you get further east it gets up to 81 percent so you can see that we do have uh you know p and k levels that that uh, can be a challenge in high high, high productive high in in soils that you want to produce high producing crops Plant growth and yields allow the minimum. You've probably heard me talk about this before, uh, it, but really is a concept I think that's uh, that's very critical when you're when you're trying to to push yields. 
Well, it, back in the 19th century, a German scientist, Justin von Liebig, was formed the law of the minimum. And really what that says is if one of the essential nutrients is deficient, plant growth will be poor, even if other essential elements are abundant. That's the law of the minimum. So really as the crop yield increases, the probability of some nutrient becoming limiting or, or will increase. So the goal then is to keep the slats of that barrel as close to the top as possible. Well, in the example you see there, it's P205, that's the limiting factor. So if you don't put any more P205, that's the limit, but you're, that's the maximum potential you're gonna get. So you add some more P205, there'll be some other slat that might be uh, the limiting factor. So like I said, the goal again is to really try to produce what the, pro provide what the plant needs so those slats of the barrel are right near the top and that's gonna maximize your uh, crop yield potential. So the specifics of what we did was a wheat, soybean, wheat, sub rotation. That's the, word, that's the goal after four years. We're gonna manage for a high yield, 80 bushel wheat, 50 bushel beans. The trial design is a, a randomized complete block with four reps. The soil sample will be collected after harvest in years two through four. The first year we collected the spring uh, soil samples just to get an idea where we were. Uh, we did collect tissue samples, early tillering and wheat, and second to third in beans. And that's the collected uh, uh, following information. So again, the soil samples at two depths. The first year and year one and four will be zero to six and six to 24 in years two and three only zero to six. And the, the one and four will be a complete analysis and two and three only P and K. Uh, the soil and plant tissue analysis will help determine if the elevated levels of P and K were causing some interaction that we don't know about. Uh, in, the research, in, the, in the literature, there's a lot of talk about interactions of, of, of P and zinc and K of, and calcium and there's others. And, and so we'll, after the four year time frame, we'll find out what that's all about. In this presentation, uh, we did have large plot trials, but that the large plot results that we talked about on the arm in the on-farm summit that's coming up in, in January. So this will just really focus on the small plot work. The small plot work uh, is, was conducted at the U of M Magnus Research Farm. This is a 40 acre site northwest of Roseau. Uh, the research team, uh, Nancy Elke, she's the PI out of St. Paul. Uh, Don Velixson, he's a manager of the research farm. Uh, myself, the research agronomist, and we had a summer intern. I will say real quickly, the Magnuson Farm, it's, uh, we're very fortunate to have just a great, great group of cooperators that uh, farm around this, this, uh, this research farm. We've had numerous uh, small plot and large plot trials in a, in a whole host of crops. Uh, I guess just uh, to the area just east of those buildings in the lower part of that picture, that's where the, the U of M uh, wheat variety plot was in 2020. And uh, so just, uh, it's really been a, been a great uh, research facility. So what happened this year? On the left is total rainfall, that's from end on. And you can see there's a different spikes there, but you could, uh, June, in June nine was the first real spike of over an inch. Then we had, you know, more rainfall than we wanted to have uh, from June nine to July 14th. And the bar chart will kind of illustrate that. In May, we were a little bit below normal, which is a great thing because in the fall of 2019, we were extremely wet. Uh, had over 14 inches of rain in September and October. Uh, we had you know, reduced precip in the wintertime in the spring. So we did get the crop in uh, in mid-June. You, you see the get the crop in the ground, but then mid in June, you see the average rainfall is a little less than four. We had over six. July is a little, little more than three. We had over eight. So that, uh, you know, for some of the crops, that was a real challenge, especially if you didn't have uh, adequate drainage. But uh, that was kind of the snapshot of what it looked like weather-wise. This again is a couple of end on uh, graphs. The one on the left shows percent of normal rainfall. The, the, the red line, you can see it starts uh, up at 125, and then it goes down to, you know, about 25% of normal. So it really dried out in, in April and May. You can see the line kind of goes up and up and up. And then you get into that, like I said, into the, the early June, 
We're about 125% of normal up to close to 175% normal in July. And then that uh, moved down into the 125% or close to normal in, in September. And so for the wheat yields, that was a little bit more rain than what we want, but soybeans uh, got that you know, good soil profile. So that really helped for our soybean yields in, in, uh, in, in August and September. The temperature departs from normal. Uh, you see the, the zero line. Most of the lines are above that zero line and, and roughly we're about 5% above normal temperatures uh, in 2020. So the background soil tests, I talked about that. Uh, that was taken in the spring of 2019. Uh, we had two sites. Uh, soil tests were pretty close to the same, except for the P level. The one site had six parts per million to start with, and one had 23. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but uh, that's the, the soil test initially in the spring of 2019. Spent a few minutes talking about soil test calibrations. This is from NDSU information, and really what it uh, just pulled out the P and K, and she looked at the Olson test for P. The very low category would be zero to three, low four to seven, and then you get up into the high, more, more than 16 ppm would be a very high soil. Okay, low is 40, high is greater than 161. So over the years, the research has been done, if, if you have a very low category, you have an 80% chance of having a, a, a positive return from, from P and K that you put on. Uh, and that, that ranges down from, from in the low of 60 to 80. You get down to the very high, you have less than 20% chance of, of a, seeing a response from what you put on. So it's just some uh, work that's been done at, uh, at NDSU and it really kind of highlights uh, some of the things that, we're, things that we're trying to do with looking at your soil tests and, and what we can do to, to kind of help that out. So the methods, uh, like I said we had two sites one wheat, one soybeans, we had 15 total treatments plus an untreated for 16. The P source was 0460, K source 0060. We had rates of 20, 40, 60, 80, and 100 units of each product individually, and then the combinations. And in this trial, the P and K would be spring applied and incorporated prior to planting. The, the wheat trial, 160 pounds of N was put on PPI. Uh, Link wheat was seeded at 120 pounds on 521. Issue samples were taken at Lake Tillering and the plots harvested at 819. So as you can see what that is, the, the Asgrove variety was planted at 521 and uh, the plants were harvested at 926. Just to give you an idea what the plants look like early season. The, the wheat trial on the left, uh, that's where the 64 individual plots were. Uh, just a typical small plot trial. And on the right was the soybeans a little bit later, but it, generally the early season uh, emergence and, and growth was very good at, at both of these locations. So the results, what did we find? And there's a lot of numbers here. So uh, I have a few bar graphs to this maybe illustrate a little bit better uh, some of the uh, research things that we saw in 2020. But this is the wheat trial treatments one, through five is P alone, six through 10 is K alone, and 11 through 15 is a combination. It's so we looked at yield, test weight, protein, soil test, P and K in parts per million, and tissue tests were in percent P and K. The very bottom, you can see the two statistical confidence levels. Um, the LSD for, for yield was 7.4. And the CV was 7.2%. But CV of 7.2 gives us a pretty good confidence level that uh, it's a pretty uh, pretty tight data set and we have some confidence that we found. So the yield ranges from 67 to 76 bushels per acre. Uh, the yields were higher from the combination of 40, 60, 80, and 100 P and K versus the untreated. And in the yield, uh, column, you can see the box there, and that's what that means. That's the, those were uh, higher than the untreated for the combinations. The K alone response was pretty flat in, in wheat. 
we was, didn't see any differences in test weight or protein for any of the treatments versus the untreated. The P applied alone or in combination at 60, 80, and 100, you can see and that's from the soil test P parts per million column. You see the box around 0, 60, and 100 at uh, the, the P alone and the combinations. So that was uh, something we've, even in the soil test that was in the entry at 16.3 parts per million, which is very high. Uh, we increased the, the part, parts per million of P from what we put on. The levels of K, all the levels of K tended to increase uh, the, the K levels in the soil. Really didn't see any, any, any difference with the uh, tissue test levels and uh, all rates of K tended to increase the, the tissue test level. So it's, it just kind of better illustrate what, uh, what the results shown. Looking at the, the vertical axis, it, the wheat yields and the horizontal is the levels of fertility, the 0, 20, 40, 60, 80. The light bar is the, is the alone, in this case, P alone. The, the dark bar is the combination P and K. So at the, at the 0 percent, at the 90 percent confidence level, rather, uh, wheat yield tended to increase with, with the, uh, in the 20 and 40, the gray bar. Then it tended to go down a little bit from the 60 to 80. Uh, it still didn't go below the untreated. So we got uh, another couple of years of kind of sort of if that's real or if that's just a, a one year phenomenon. But uh, like I said, the wheat yields, the, the, the dark bar increased you know, from 40, 60, 80, and 100 percent compared to the untreated. And that was a, a 6.2 bushel yield or more. The K yields, same setup. Light bar is the alone, dark bar is the combination. Uh, again, the combination of 40, 60, 80, and 100 increased the wheat yields and the, the, the K alone was relatively flat uh, on, on wheat yield. Soil test P uh, goes from zero to, to 40 on the vertical axis and, and the, the same thing on, on, on the horizontal the 20, 40, 60, 80. E alone or in the combinations of 60, 80, and 100 increased soil test levels P, even with that high, this is the site that had the high uh, initial soil test level. And at K, same setup. Uh, maybe was a trend for higher, higher K levels uh, from K alone, but uh, we got to do a little bit, little additional research to figure that out. So soybeans, kind of the same setup. Treatments one to, to five are the, the P alone, five to 10 are the, are the K alone, and 11 to 15 is the combinations. So again, we looked at yields, test weight, protein, oil, soil, and tissue test result. So again, at the confidence levels, looking at the LSC at the 10% level for yield was 6.5, the CV 7.8. So again, with that uh, CV, a pretty good confidence level in, in, uh, in this data set. So the yields range from 61 to 69.8 bushels. The yields were higher from the combination of 20, 40, and 60 of P and K versus the untreated. And that's the, in the yield column, that's the, the box that's uh, significant, significant, that indicates uh, where those yields were, were different or higher than the untreated uh, based on that uh, LSD level of 90% of, of confidence level. So, no treatment differences were determined in test weight and protein. The P alone, uh, or, or in combinations at 60, 80, and 100, increased the P level of the soil test that was taken after harvest. Um, in this particular case, uh, as the rate of P increased, uh, so did uh, the soil test level. You know, the graph would show that better. And the soil test levels, uh, in K, all tend to increase with all K rates. So looking at the, the graphs, it'd be similar as the last one. And this was soybean yields, uh, bushes per acre on the vertical, the fertility levels on the horizontal. The, looking at P rate, so the, uh, the 20, 40, and 60 uh, increase soybean yields by 6.5 bushels or more 
compared to the untreated. And you, you look at, uh, you know, the, especially at the gray, at the, the alone, you see a little bit, maybe a little trend for a little less uh, as you get higher. Uh, but it really was everything was above the untreated. So again, more more work left to be done to, to iron that out. That's just a just a one year phenomenon, or if it's something that we that we were seeing for real. So the the K rate, same setup, yield on the on the vertical, fertility rate on the horizontal. Uh, the combination of P and K at 20, 40, and 60 increased the soybean yields compared to the untreated. Again, looking at uh, as you get to higher rates, there may be a little bit of a trend for some depression of soybean yields. But again, this is one year data. We'll find out uh, if that's true or if it's just a, a one year phenomenon as we go by, as, we go, as the years go on. So the soil test P levels, this is the low site. You know, the parts per million P is on the vertical. Soil test, the soil applied nutrients on the horizontal. You can see as the levels of P increased, so did the soil test level for both alone or the combination. What do you find out with K? Soil tests with K were pretty much similar uh, for, for both at this particular site. So the summary then of the small plot trial, back to two, two trials, we did see higher wheat yields from the combination of 40, 60, 80, and 100 of P and K compared to, to the untreated. Higher soybean yields from the combination of 20, 40, and 60 for P and K versus the untreated. And the P levels tended to increase as, as the P rate increased in both the soil testing low, 3.3, or high, 16.3. And the, the K levels tended to increase, uh, especially at the 80 and 100 units of K. No differences were detected in soybean and wheat test weight, protein, and oil. No treatment effects in PRK tissue tests and beans. In wheat, so we saw a tissue test increase in K, but not P. And this is the, the third year this trial will be conducted in 2001. Uh, with that, any questions or comments or discussion? Uh, Dave, uh, how many years yeah. have you done this and how many years do you plan on doing it? This, this is, we're at the halfway point. This is year two. So next year will be year three. Um, just, uh, I'm kind of just paraphrasing here, but when you see responses from 20 to 40 to 60 of the combination, that kind of seems to be the sweet spot that a lot of growers do. Um, however, it is nice to see the uh, parts per million carryover. Any comments on that? Well, like I said, this is just a one year snapshot, Chris, with, with what it is. And I, the, the interesting part to me was even in the, so, uh, the soil, the, the tested pretty high in P, you know, 16 in the untreated by applying additional P and K, we did also see a response there. We kind of suspected something in the lower testing soil. But again, this is the one year snapshot. So we're, before we make any, any recommendation for that, we got to get another year under the belt for sure. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, I had a question on the blend of P and K, but that's on the charts. We'll probably just have to go back and look at those individual. Properties. Yeah, it was, uh, we used the, uh, we used 0460 and 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 0060 for the for the P and K source. Okay. Any other questions? Um here, here's a good question, Dave. Uh any uh any hypothesis on why the higher rates had a negative effect? And if you looked at your charts, we topped out and had a little bit of decrease in yield. Um it actually wasn't that many bushels and then maybe no, you're gonna have to answer on the carryover on the uh, carryover right, and it wasn't you know it did uh it was a little bit of a depression but it didn't go below the level of the untreated so it was okay. it was a you know it was like you said below the sweet spot and i don't really have a good explanation you know maybe the the high level of rainfall had a little bit to do with it we had 14 inches 14 inches of rain in june and july uh not sure if that you know, got a little bit more into the, you know, concentrated the root zone closer to the yeah. top until I got a chance to, to grow more. I don't have, I don't have a good, a good reason for that. But that's just uh, kind of off, off the top of the head. Okay. Any other quick questions? Uh, with that, uh, Dave, thank you very much. Uh, you said you're in the middle of a four-year project. Is that what it was? That is correct. And uh, looking forward to uh, visiting with you uh, throughout the next couple of years. Yeah, and then, like I said, the, the large plot component, they'll be talked about at the, at the summit coming up in, in January.
Okay. Thank you, Dave. And then uh, any contact information? Um, just uh, look you up through. There we go. There you go.